It is my pleasure to welcome you to our event this evening, which is the second in our new Future of Talk series presented in partnership with Mesh, our venue partner, and Grender, our community partner. For those of you in this room who can't stay off your phones for an hour, I'm looking at you. It's okay. You're welcome to post about this event while it's happening. You can use the hashtag Future of or tag us at Business Worthy. Who is us? What do I mean? Business for Peace is an international foundation based in Oslo that believes that every business leader should have it at the core of their purpose to improve society. And of course, in 2019, a big part of that is thinking about sustainability. Last year, we launched the Oslo Climate Leadership Declaration, which got large international companies to commit to setting science-based targets in line with the Paris Agreement. Each year, we give out the Oslo Business for Peace Award to exceptional global business leaders who are setting an example and truly making a difference in the world with their companies. And so tonight, we're here to talk about climate leadership and specifically what roles businesses have to play in that. For our January event, I looked up a bunch of fun facts about cities to have in my back pocket to share. And I tried to do the same this month, but there are no fun facts about climate change. But there is hope. And I see a lot of hope in what business's role can be in leading the changes that we have to undergo in the coming years and decades. And so to kick us off, I'm pleased to introduce Carolina, who is the deputy CEO of WWF Norway. She's done a lot of work in their business sector collaborations, working on how we can actually achieve the green shift and the sustainable development goals by 2030, but particularly how we can do that with cross-sector work. So over to you, Carolina. Thank you so much. And first of all, I'm glad to see so many people here tonight. I was thinking it's winter holiday and all of my Instagram, my Snap is all about people in the mountains. So I'm really glad to see all of you here. I want to reflect a little bit about the title of this event. We say the future of climate leadership. And that says something maybe about what we think currently, that there isn't enough leadership right now. We have to tackle climate change. We know we have to cut emissions, but even so, we say it and say it over again, we need to act now. Still, there seems to be some impatience among the audience, among policymakers, among NGOs, among business sectors, among teenager and activists like Greta Thunberg. The message is repeatedly, we are not doing enough. And why aren't we doing enough? Many people ask us here in WBF. Is it because the NGOs are so negative, always pointing with their fingers, you can't, you have to do more? Or is it because the facts isn't out there? We know that we do have the facts. And I want to reflect some a little bit around the commitments the world have made in terms of climate. It's a little bit set the uh, back, kind of set the, set the stage for the conversation we're going to have. Because, as it says on the Facebook site for this event, we know that we have to act now and that we are in crisis. We know that the Paris Agreement has to be implemented. But what actually are actually the Paris Agreement? And I live in a world where I talk about climate change each day with peers around me. But it also comes to my knowledge not that everybody learn and know what the Paris Agreement actually is, what have the world committed to. The Paris Agreement is an agreement within the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, also known as the UNCCC, dealing with greenhouse gas emissions mitigation, adaptation, and finance. The Paris Agreement, for the first time, brings all nations into a common cause to undertake ambitious efforts to combat climate change and adapt to its effects. With enhanced support to assist developing countries to do so as well. In 2018, in October last year, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or also known as IPPC, they had a special report on global warming of one and a half degree. That report was an eye-opener for many, because the report made it clear that the global community needs to move much faster if we are to limit warming and the related impacts on the world we, which we live. The resulting message 
from the scientific body underline the critical need for a deep transformational change in every sector. Climate scientists dwell delved into the wide-ranging impacts of warming climate will have, including extreme heat waves, severe droughts, coral bleaching, and more impacts we are already experiencing at our current one degree warming, following one of the hottest years on record. So all in all, scientists are increasingly aware that half a degree of warming matters. We must have laser focus on delivering the one and a half degree and we need to halve greenhouse gas emissions globally by 2030 and cut coal, coal use by two thirds at the same date. So that message is out there and it's more or less accepted. So now we come to the tricky part and that's how to get there. We know that now more and more investors acknowledge that investments decisions needs to be guided by climate, rich, climate risk. The governor of the Bank of England Mark Carney have rightfully emphasized the increasing imperative to financial stability for asset owners to disclose their climate vulnerabilities and the need to invest in low-carbon low opportunities. Just last week, the European Council conclusions on climate diplomacy stated, climate change is a direct and existential threat, which will spare no country. The world is already witnessing multiple devastating impacts of climate change, yet action to steam remains insufficient. Furthermore, Chancellor Merkel also said, the climate crisis emerging as number one global security challenge. But we also know that making policy takes time and also to implement policy takes longer time. And not at least, that many of the policymakers are also maybe more concerned about getting votes instead of implementing tough decisions. So that's why I'm glad to be here today with the business sector, because more and more people, and I would say including me, is looking more to the corporate sector on how we can work with them, not to wait for the policymakers to get the change we need. We will now hear from IKEA and Telenor, and what they are thinking around how they can contribute and what their company is doing around climate change and their responsibility as businesses. Not to say they're going to answer all of the challenges we have, but we're going to learn a little bit more from what they are doing as companies. And then we're going to have a conversation. I have prepared some questions, hopefully not too tough, to discuss. And we will also open up for a couple of questions from the floor before we end in about an hour. So first, I want to welcome to the stage Anders, who is the Sustainability Director of IKEA here in Norway. Thank you. Anders is my name, Sustainability Manager and Swede, which is super painful a day like this. Uh, well, <laughs> when it comes to skiing, it's actually more or less always painful. Uh, However, we are not here to uh, talk so much about the World Championships, uh, luckily. Uh, I'm just sharing briefly some of the uh, things we are doing and how we think around sustainability at large and climate uh, in more uh, specific. But I wanted to start with the vision, which I tend to start with when I'm out talking, because it's the reason why many of us at IKEA are working in the company and something that uh, hopefully is inspiring many others as well. IKEA's vision is to create a better every day for the many people. And back when that was founded in 70s, uh, it was very much about offering home furnishings to low prices. But during the years, it has come to mean so much more. It's not only about our customers, it's about our co-workers, our suppliers and their co-workers. It's about the local communities where we are operating. And it's about the planet, the environment. Uh, working for a business that uh, has a purpose higher than only uh, profit is a big strength. Uh, and I'm lucky to, to be in such a company that not only look at the top and bottom line, uh, but there are space for more than that. I'm a little bit more analog than uh, 
Kawaline here. Um, I can't even imagine what uh, the next speaker will. <laughs> uh, it's not something super fancy. Uh, around six years ago, uh, the uh, sustainability strategy, people and planet positive came. Uh, it's, it was a game changer for us at IKEA because we did not talk about reducing environmental impact or minimizing impact. We talked about having a positive impact. And that is kind of a mind-blowing or shift in how we can, how we should think. Um, it means, in, in essence, that, that the, the net of our activities should be positive uh, towards people and the planet. And one could ask, how, how, how can you achieve that? How can you measure that? And so on and so on. But I will give you a couple of examples going uh, on here. Uh, setting bold and hairy goals has been a success factor for us at IKEA. Bold goals create energy and engagement among everyone working in the company. It also creates renewal and innovation, aspects that are super important in the shift towards a green economy. Tonight, this, the focus is on the climate and um, how we uh, hopefully take and show leadership within that area. But it is also really important, especially for a customer facing company like IKEA to lead by example yourself. Because if we only would talk about what the consumers or customers could or should do, uh, we would not be credible. Uh, so uh, that's why we have a super, uh, I'm saying super a lot now, I will stop doing that soon. Uh, uh, we have um, very ambitious goals. We are saying that we will be climate positive uh, in 2030. That means that we will reduce our greenhouse gas emissions more uh, than what we, um, uh, yeah, more than we uh, reduce more than... Uh, uh, than when we emit. Thank you, Carolina. And uh, of course, it's, it's also going through the entire value chain. So we include raw materials, production, transport, and our operations in our stores, customer transport, and so on. And of course, we don't have all the answer of exactly how everything that is going to happen. But having the goal is changing our or triggering uh, our, our uh, innovation and, and renewal and, and uh, is, is really giving energy to, to, to try to meet those goals. We are also, uh, have also committed to uh, use uh, as much renewable energy that, than we consume by 2020 already. It's just one year away or maybe even yeah, about one year away. And we are uh, actually going to meet that goal, more or less. I mean, I can't really promise 100%, but we are at 80% now. So we own and operate like more windmills than we operate stores. We have a, a large number of solar panels in our stores all over the world. So it, it's... it's um, we see that it's important to invest in uh, cleaner technology technology uh, for our business, because we want to survive, we want to continue to deliver to our vision. But it's also a signal to the society that this is important. Maybe you should also consider investing in cleaner energy. Uh, of course, what I said, that leading by example and doing things yourself, that is really important, uh, not least for a credibility reasons. Uh, we also do this because it makes good business sense and because we want it. But the biggest impact we can have uh, is actually through our product solutions and uh, services. That means that uh, when we offer uh, products that reduce energy, that reduce waste, that reduce uh, water and so on, with the scale that we have, it has an enormous impact on, for example, energy consumption. And maybe we don't think about that always, but uh, this is something we are working a lot with and will uh, accelerate and escalate uh, going forward, providing ever more products that are helping people to live a more sustainable life at home. Uh, 
products, solutions and services are important, but uh, I think that uh, uh, the meeting with our customers is sort of really key here. And we can meet the customers in different ways, in our stores, of course, but also in other channels. And the co-workers are playing a really important role there as ambassadors and uh, sort of sharing their knowledge around how people can choose or make sustainable choices and how to sort of reduce their own footprint. We are not always there. We are not there yet fully, but that is our ambition, that we should be much better in the meeting with the customer. We can also work with seminars and we can work with all kinds of different activities. But our goal is to make sustainable living a desirable choice that is attractive, that is accessible and that is affordable. Living uh, sustainably should not be a luxury that only a few can afford. It should be sort of accessible and available for everyone. Uh, nudging is another ex very exciting thought. Thank you. Uh, and uh, this we have tried or are trying. For anyone who has been at IKEA, you see that the veggie hot dog has a lower price than the meat hot dog. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm a little proud of that, actually. Uh, but, um, of course, it's, it's a way... I didn't get that fully. But anyway, it's, uh, it's, um, it has turned out to be a success that, that more and more people are going for the vegan or vegetarian alternative. And that's good for them, for their health, and it's good for the planet. And I think that that, might be, that could be super, super exciting to, <laughs> uh, to uh, explore more to work with nudging. Um, I think I'll uh, stop here, but I wanted to also catch up or, or sort of uh, build on you what you say here, because I think that we cannot solve the climate uh, situation alone. We need to work together. The, uh, the uh, business, uh, NGOs, the politicians and so on. So we open our, our race, uh, pull out our hand and uh, and welcome any sort of cooperation in, in that area. I'll, I'll, I'll stop here for now, but you'll hear more in a, in a second. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. And with that, I want to welcome Jan from Telenor, who is Vice President and Head of the Supply Chain, Sustainability and Environment. Hello, everyone. And of course, we do feel sorry for Sweden today, so that's all right. Well, we are all consumers, aren't we? So I give you three choices now to understand uh, what about the future. You can choose from uh, one of the three. Uh, three, four hamburgers, 40 kilometers of driving a normal car, or one year of full services from a mobile operator connecting you to the internet. So, correct. So that's uh, actually the opportunity side for um, a, a mobile operator like not only Telenor, but the industry at large, that we do need a lot of energy to produce your need for Netflix 24-7, wherever you are. Uh, the data traffic has increased at 5, 6 last year, 80% per year. Uh, and it's physical laws that... Whatever you need, we have to produce and put in energy to su supply uh, that need. But that need could be um, uh, sustainable. And the footprint, um, six, seven kilos per year per end consumer is nothing. Being a Norwegian here, you represent 10 tons of CO2 at the least per year in your daily life. Not your personal spending, but the whole infrastructure around you. And if you do travel once a year to Thailand, you can add two, uh, two tons of CO2 on top of that, and so on and so on. So if you should offset your life in Norway, you should probably pay two to 3,000 kroners that will go into a, a project that will take away your footprint in Norway. So think about that, a voluntary type of tax. I think that would be probably one of the solutions for the future, that we all have to take the end bill of the carbon that we all are a part of in the value chain. 
So what about Telenor? Well, we are, we are, our footprint is from the very high north of the globe, the Arctic region with Svalbard, to the very southeast area of Asia in the tropic area of Borneo. That's quite a stretch. So even if we can do be climate neutral in Sweden by offsetting uh, or uh, or buying only renewable energy, we still have to to use 70 million liter of diesel in our Asian operations because there are no electricity around. And those base stations has been built before the solar power were um, cheap enough. But we have started that journey. So. Uh, in the future, when we do have a new base station, solar will probably be the, the most financially sound investment at the place. But still, it's a lot of infrastructure uh, to take um, out of the uh, equation. Um, our industry, I think, represents the opportunity side, as I said. Um, have you heard about Internet of Things? Yeah. So we have 170 million people connected to internet, but we as a company has also 13 million things connected to the internet. This is a thing. It's a GPS tracker. So we're, uh, it's a, just a small example uh, of an internet of things. Uh, if it's useful or not, it depends on the, on the use, of course. But when I will run deep into the forest and my wife starts worrying where I am, she can follow me wherever I am in the forest. It has a, a, a fencing, so if I go beyond that fence, a, an alarm will um, hit her. <laughs> if I stand still for more than 10 minutes, another alarm will hit her. She probably realized I'm already dead, so she, she can do whatever. But this is an example that small things, it could be the refrigerator, it could be the car. I have electric car, so of course there's a SIM card in it. It demonstrates that you can probably uh, do more resource efficiency in society than without these things. You can optimize your car driving. You can um, uh, make the car connect to internet, so demonstrate where you go are going to um, go beyond the traffic uh, hassle. Um, and uh, Telno operates this uh, globally. So typically a Volvo, a Swedish, still a Swedish car, isn't it? Well, China. oh, it's kind of, yeah. <laughs> Chinese these days. Yeah, yeah. Scania Vabis is uh, Swedish. Scania? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we have operation in uh, um, globally. So, for instance, Scania Vabis, uh, I've seen the Scania Vabis in Bolivia. I were, went there for a few years ago on uh, climbing. And that, in that Scania Vabis, that was a SIM card from Telenor, making that um, uh, operate in a very efficient way and uh, as an industry. Um, collaboration with um, with the Scandinavian office. and I think that's the, the key point. Uh, as an individual company, we can't do all things alone. We have to involve the whole sector so that we have level playing field. That uh, that someone does more than the other is not necessarily good, especially for the competition. I think the value chain from the producer of service or the goods. Uh, and out to the end consumer has to be a value chain that is tightly connected so that the incentives at the consumer side that also uh, reflect on the producer side. And not at least, I think the, the public part, the private partnership is a very key instrument to achieve the, as Carolyn said, the, said that the politicians are not necessarily here for them. The uh, forever per uh, perspective, therefore, uh, have to be re-elected, and um, that's uh, has, uh, I think the demo uh, democratic um, instrument there is too short-sighted to uh, really solve the overall long-term solution. But we need uh, that type of collaboration so that um, the, uh, the business can be in the tool for the pol political wise and uh, decisions and uh, work together. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. This is actually how it looked on the stage today after the female women's sprint. It was well, Norway, Sweden, Norway. I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> no. <Rub it> in. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you both for um, some interesting perspective and also to learn more about what you do in your companies. Um, very often when we hear these companies, we hear the picture-perfect speech, if you know what I mean. 
uh, about companies being responsible, taking their full value change, now talking a bit climate positive instead of climate neutral, and so on. But also, in all of this, you are faced with a lot of dilemmas. Um, you, even though you talk about the not just looking at the top and bottom line, still there is very heavily incentives kind of for making money, producing more, being the most relevant company out there and being measured and a lot of things. So making the choices you are now doing as companies. So for example, can you give us a little bit of um, how would it look in one of your conference room when you are discussing new strategies? What are you going to do? For example, in selling this vegetar hot dog uh, for a lesser price. You know, what are the motivation for doing so? Is it because it seems the end consumer wants it as a good market incentive, or is it part of the whole value change of the companies? Well, uh, we don't sell vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Uh, that, but I, I would say it's both because, of course, we see that the market or the etter um, special the the. the demand um, is uh, increasing for vegetarian and vegan food. So uh, introducing the veggie dog is, of course, one answer to that. But we also see that this was a perfect opportunity to actually steer the customer towards the more sustainable alternative. And it's a bit... I would say it's a bit bold uh, because, I mean, of course, uh, traditionally it has been made out of pork and, well, meat. And uh, uh, we were sort of expecting that someone would be a bit uh, angry or disappointed or have opinions about that. But we have heard from very few and uh, it's actually more the opposite that they really uh, appreciate that we are uh, offering a, a, an affordable uh, vegetarian hot dog. So, and and uh, of course, uh, uh, maybe that person buying the five crowner five crowns uh, veggie dog is also buying something else, and so on and so on. So, I think it's it's both business and heart at the same time. And I think that goes actually for for many of the discussions that we are having. Uh, it's they are both values based, but also business or commercial to high extent. Yeah, and what about your conference rooms? How are the discussion discussion going around, for example? Well, the transition from using diesel at the base to going to solar, the investments cost may be high right now and will pay off, say, say 10 to 20 years. So how do you defend that investment? I don't think we defend it any, anymore. I think um, bringing uh, our mission is uh, empowering society, which is kind of bold broad um, emission with a lot of dilemmas in it so uh, we are um, uh, we bring uh, information to the end uh, consumer the people so that has uh, the arab spring that was uh, a signal that uh, open information can change the society in a, perhaps a good way or not um, we are have been five years in um, operating in Myanmar. That was a very good, um, exciting years when everybody, everybody was cheering for Myanmar and the government. Uh, it's a little more, uh, somewhat more stressful now because of human rights issues. But still, um, Myanmar is an example. It was the last mobile, uh, the country in the world without the mobile uh, communication for the people. Um, Seven, it's around 20 million people living in Myanmar. 17% uh, of the people in Myanmar do, don't have uh, access to electricity. Many of those don't have even roads, especially in the rain time. But uh, we were supposed to give all of them Facebook. Uh, and, and, um, and mobile operations is not something that you start up uh, by yourself. It's a very regulated area. So we had to apply for a license, and we got in a huge competition, uh, one of the licenses for Myanmar. So I'm not. Uh, so we are actually involved in the, um, not only the infrastructure business, but also changing society, hopefully in, in most aspects for the better. But uh, I'm not sure if the older, uh, the old lady I met, uh, have met a few times in a little village in Myanmar, and her main dream has come through. She's on a smartphone. Literally, she has her own smartphone and she's on Facebook. I'm not sure if that really is a, a, a positive change by itself, but that it is at least an opportunity for good change. 
So picking up a little bit about the dilemmas you have, um, and I think all of us has, who live in Norway have gotten the news about Repafjorden uh, and the debate about having the need for rare materials uh, for technology development, the green shift, but also it's that kind of how do you weigh some of these decisions in terms of you want to do something good, but at the same time you have a large impact, for example, on the biodiversity. And for we have two challenges we need to address, not just the climate change, but also to stop the loss of biodiversity that we have to tackle uh, at the same time. So how are you discussing these dilemmas when your, some of your business is dependent on materials? that comes with human rights problems, biodiversity problems, and at the same time, bringing the solution for some of solving some of the climate emissions. Of course, we as a, a company work within the framework of uh, legislation and um, best practice standards. Um, we are a small company by by the number of employees, uh, 20,000 uh, 20, people only, but uh, we have a huge uh, ecosystem around us with suppliers, um, around 1 million people uh, uh, working for us, Tenor only. So what we do um, um, in that field, that we, we um, put up um, um, the requirements for our um, uh, suppliers, uh, uh, typically producing them as uh, smartphones, so uh, with um, 50, 16 other uh, um, huge mobile operators, we have um, a setup of an uh, audit system so that we inspect all um, uh, Chinese factories producing smartphones, uh, factories outside China as well, um, and then make sure that they follow the, the, the specified standards also with, the, uh, with the relation to biodiversity, but also conflict minerals and, uh, as an example. So we, we try to put up the same same fr framework uh, that you would expect the society around uh, our business would uh, require from us and uh, make sure that the producers of the hardware uh, are following them as well. And to both of you on that is we all always talk about new materials. We need new pick kind of new resources, uh, but also we know that there is a huge potential in thinking more circular economy and reuse and recycle. How are your companies addressing that? Yeah, thank you for asking. I was uh, <laughs> sitting here waiting, actually, just to take the phone, uh, microphone. But uh, no, no. Uh, now, because, I mean, just like uh, Telenor, we are also dependent on raw material. I mean, we want to continue to furnish the world, but the supply of raw material will not be the same as it has been in the past. We are working towards only using renewable material or recycled material. And the recycled part will have a very important role going forward. We know that the, uh, the prices of raw material are getting higher as they are getting more and more scarce. So for us, it's about survival and living up to our vision and, and goals to really find new sources for uh, raw material. And the amount of material we already have out in the society, in people's homes, in, uh, in uh, deponies, in landfills, and so on and so on, is huge. And if we can just learn and develop technology to uh, uh, use that uh, in an efficient and good way, uh, we uh, will, of course, uh, yeah, we have solved at least a bit of the issue. But uh, I think circular economy is an answer to a lot of things. Uh, it's very com It starts already with circular design in the first phase. In our case, it means that the products must be come from uh, the material must be renewable or recycle. We must be able to repair and upgrade a product. You got need to have get access to spare parts and so on and so on. Uh, and and then we have the whole sort of raw material supply chain aspects of it, using uh, what we call today waste as new raw material uh, into the supply chain. And then finally, for us in Norway, in the market, uh, it's the way of meeting our customers, offering services rather than products. And it's really interesting and inspiring and mind-blowing. And to really think about maybe in five years or 10 years, we are not selling products, we are selling services, like furniture as a service providing a sort of, okay, you can subscribe to, the, to your bedroom, to your children's room, and so on. Uh, 
uh, we can offer repair, we can offer upgrade, we can do this and that. And that, that is what is so exciting with this because, yeah, you can at first be a bit uh, worried or scared about in the direction the world is going, but and also how, how will it go for the business. But if you then think about all the opportunities it gives, new revenue streams that we haven't thought of before, it, it, you go from sort of denial, confusion into inspiration, and that's where we are. So to Telenor as well then, um, you, a lot of the kind of technology we have requires new hardware, so a new kind of dings <laughs> the whole time for everything. Uh, kind of how are you going about from kind of maybe doing the same as IKEA thinking and going from not needing to update hardware, but maybe just the software? Um, I think uh, that's a dilemma of our industry. Um, electronic waste is probably one of the big um, uh, negative issues around our industry. Uh, what we do is that we have very tight rules for uh, our operations, so recycling, reusing, reselling, making sure that uh, the goods, uh, the waste, which is, uh, you know, today we are almost starting now with the 5G fifth generation of, of, of uh, mobile networks, uh, which is all about I IoT, the Internet of Things. But for, for each G, um, three, we are in 4G now in, in Norway normally, you have to replace all your uh, equipment. And we make sure that that is resold, reused, recycled in, in a proper uh, way. Um, and we also, on top of that, uh, ask our customers to hand in their old phones uh, and and have had campaigns for that, um, paying them out. We had, um, for many years, a, a big cooperation with um, uh, um, the local um, um, athletics clubs so that they could, instead of selling a calendar or whatever, uh, they, uh, they collected the phones in the neighborhood and got paid uh, 30 krona per per, um, per old phone, whatever standard, and um, and we could also take the, that as a, a, a cost, but also reselling the the, the, the old things to a, another market or reusing the metal or, or, or the or the or, or, or the goods. So I think um, th that's the. Um, the negative side of being part of a kind of a fashion industry, like uh, uh, mobile uh, phones are, uh, you have to, you have to have another new phone every second year, um, both for fashion reasons, but also for the practical reasons. I guess uh, that's not st sustainable in the end. So, what are you company doing in terms of in terms of leadership? And uh, one thing is to kind of having your own strategy, doing your own thing in your own value chain. But how can you, if you're not doing it already, um, contribute to kind of getting more companies on board to be the voice of changes, being willing to admit that ne ne not necessarily everything has been solved, uh, and being a little bit bold and taking kind of a public voice in terms of saying we have to cut emissions, we have to do some changes, we can't go about as we have done so far. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think um, uh, we as an industry have to do something together uh, as an industry rather than individual companies. Um, so in these days, we are actually discussing if we should take the following bold uh, ambition. By 2030, the whole Europe is going to cut uh, their emission by 40 percent, the CO2 emissions. Uh, we think we as an industry should have an ambition to be climate neutral uh, by 2030. But now it's climate positive. Well, uh, that's our own <laughs> footprint. And then if you, um, we can demonstrate uh, that uh, if you take the good, uh, good um, need for our services, if, if you can replace the 40-kilometer drive with a car, with a phone call, or we have um, uh, Skyping uh, instead of traveling, et cetera, uh, we have um, had a recent study that uh, demonstrated that we can tenfold uh, the good side of our industry, taking away 20% of the global CO2 emissions. If you use IoT, uh, ICT, and uh, mobile communication in a proper way. I think that's, um, uh, of the SDGs and the, the United Nations uh, Development Goals, I think uh, we have a positive impact on all those in one way or the other as an industry. So Anders, is IKEA speaking up? 
Yeah, I, I well, we could always do more and say more and be more vocal. Uh, but uh, I, when it comes to climate change, uh, sometimes we almost see ourselves as activists. Maybe that is to take it a bit too far. But within the business world, at least, I think that we have taken a really clear leadership in uh, in uh, addressing uh, climate change. And that is through uh, participating in sort of global conferences and the UN and all of that, but also fi founding um, sort of the uh, EV100, which is a coalition between companies wanting only to use emission-free vehicles and so on. So we can do different, a lot of different things. I also uh, sort of what I said before, embrace cooperation or collaboration to initiate and be part of a bigger movement. Uh, I think that is really important and uh, part of uh, being a responsible company is that is also to advocate for climate and, and, uh, and uh, sustainability. But I, I, I still wanted to, maybe you're coming back with questions about that, but I think that in, all, in many of the discussions, we forget about consumers. Uh, are we coming back to that? We can take it now, if you want. Okay. <laughs> yeah, as you can see, this is not uh, practiced before. Uh, uh, because I think that, uh, yes, both me or we and Telenor can do a lot of things and we are doing things and we have a responsibility to do things. But being a big player, big uh, sort of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, having a big business, you also, it also comes with a, a responsibility to do right, but also opportunities to influence. And of course, we talked about the influences, other businesses, politicians, and all of that, but also consumers. And, and I think that if we're going to fully succeed uh, with the transition towards a greener uh, world or economy, we also need the consumers with us. And I think that's when it's starting to get a bit tricky. We know that many of you, uh, probably all of you sitting here tonight, are very committed to to uh, climate and, and to live more sustainably. But uh, we have to also think about the uh, many people uh, which maybe don't know how or yeah, uh, don't want to compromise on quality or on uh, yeah, price or design or anything. And we need to sort of uh, enable people to make the sustainable choices without having to compromise. And I think there we have, as a society and businesses, a, a long way to go. Uh, but at least we are committed to, to continue doing it and doing it much more. Uh, creating a movement, it can be really strong. Uh, we don't need everyone at once to join the movement, but at some point we will reach the tipping point and then it will be the new norm, living sustainably. So uh, I, I'm really, um, yeah, this is what makes me going, uh, if I put it like that. So this means if I as a customer go in an IKEA store, a restaurant, um, I don't have to think about the choices I'm making because you have already done it for me? Yeah, well, today uh, we will help you taking the right decision by either nudging you or informing you that this is a more sustainable choice. That doesn't mean that the other products suck, uh, if I put it like that. <laughs> uh, but uh, there are, after all, products that are better for both people and the environment. And they, we are highlighting and will highlight much more. So it will be easier to, uh, to take the choice. Um, Comment from you, Jan, before we open up for some Q and A. Sure, I, I think on the, on the society level, I think we should um, put price on carbon on all parts of the value chain. So, so the service or the product should have that, that price incorporated in one way or the other. That, that's tricky to do it in practical way, but uh, I think that's the only way out of uh, this. I think um, as an industry, we should um, pay for our um, carbon um, uh, emissions. And we will put that price on our products and share it with the end consumer, so they will take part of that bill 
uh, for Telenor to offset our 1 million ton CO2 footprint from Asia, um, uh, we have 3 million customers here in Norway. We have uh, 170 million customers uh, in Asia. 97% uh, of our CO2 footprint is from Asia, five countries in Asia, due to the infrastructure and um, uh, grid power uh, situation. I think we should offset that. It uh, will cost us 200 million kroners. I don't think offsetting alone is a good answer or anything. So I think we should uh, start spending uh, more money on um, the right investments in um, energy uh, purchase and also as an industry take an uh, obligation on um, on going rather fast to the uh, neutral um, energy um, part of our business and make sure that we are part, uh, really a part of a solution, that we have only a positive upside using the services rather than you have to subtract the, the negative footprint. Okay, any questions from the room? Do you have a microphone? Do you want to go? Hello. Yeah. So this uh, question, my name is Bent Erik. This question is mostly to uh, IKEA. So I was at IKEA yesterday, and I was very happy both with the uh, hot dog, uh, vegan hot dog, but a little disappointed that I could not buy. Uh, hot dogs uh, frozen. Uh, so I have complained about that at least 10 times at uh, Schleppen, but uh, apparently you, are, you have not been informed. But that, that is uh, th th that aside. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking I was there to buy uh, furniture also. Uh, and my question is, uh, is there a movement towards branding the products with their actual CO2 footprint, because that would interest me. You know, if I have a choice between two uh, chairs, if the one has sort of uh, uh, 10 kilograms of CO2 footprint and the other one has 100, I would uh, personally prefer the 10 uh, kilogram uh, footprint. Is, is there a movement in that direction? Thank you for the question or questions. And first, just uh, on the side then, that uh, you will be very pleased uh, soon uh, uh, <laughs> because I now I just made a call here in and and uh, they will come frozen in April and uh, uh, yeah. and uh, if there are any sweets the name of the product will make total sense it's called Kov Moy but for the rest of you it will sound just stupid uh, <laughs> Uh, when it comes to um, displaying or being transparent about the footprint, there are no immediate plans, I must admit and be honest to say. However, we are looking into transparency overall because we think that consumers are not only interested in the footprint, but also where it has been produced, how it has been produced, the stories and the conditions behind it. So it's part of a bigger package, but uh, I, I, I can't sit here and say uh, if it will come and when it will come, but it's, it's more a bigger transparency issue uh, that we are looking at. Is there a question on this side of the room? Uh, thank you for a great um, a talk. Uh, you started talking about the relevance of uh, Reparfjorn. Uh, so what, how do we change issues on the other side of the world? But, uh, I come from Circular Norway and I love how you address the need for circular design, circular business development and creating demand for the new way to uh, design our supply chains. Uh, we see that metals and the ICT industry will be delivering the new plastics. If you find plastic uncomfortable, we can't wait to see what will happen when we discover the uh, footprint and the uh, <laughs> ugly uh, visuals of materials. 45 million tons of metals are disappearing out of our waste systems. We have only track of five of them. 40 is lost still. And we discussed the Repafjorn case. We take it for granted that we can empty our earth for copper. The discussion is about waste. Our willingness to talk about the burden and cost of dealing with waste as a problem in the linear economy. How can you recommend us to 
how do we uh, how can businesses uh, go in front and not be regulated for uh, stopping this uh, unneeded way of using materials but how could this be a, a business opportunity for doing urban mining we have enough copper how do we extract the copper which as already is in our value chains and put that into the debate of reparfjorn we haven't heard that yet and it's very interesting and it could be an opportunity for all of you to turn that issue right now. I think that was an excellent point. And I think most people are not aware of this. Uh, I don't think urban mining is an expression that people know about. Uh, and that actually how much is wasted. And I think this could be also an interesting question to tell a new on kind of how can you play a role to get that message out there that the different materials is actually not waste, it's a resource. Thank you for the question. Um, we did uh, actually use the word term urban mining when we did have a col collaboration with the Athletic Clubs uh, Association. Um, but the volume of that, uh, of course, it didn't save the world in this area. Uh, and I think uh, some good uh, cooperation with um, the, uh, the public part would probably strengthen our way of doing this. Uh, um, Obviously, our own uh, equipment, as I said, we re recycle and d uh, do urban mining in that way. But I think uh, the whole setup of using in a linear way rather than a circular way, I think uh, still it's a long way to go. And our industry is not the, the ones that goes in the f forefront of that, uh, sadly enough, at the moment at least. Maybe it's not relevant for copper, but uh, I think also it's part of the leadership uh, to uh, be a front runner here, to maybe invest a bit more into developing new technology in order to speed up the uh, uh, speed up the uh, solutions, because maybe the market will not do that since it's not profitable at all today. It's actually costing a lot of money. So I think that uh, we can uh, help the recycling industry to take steps by. Uh, investing in it, being part of it. For example, just taking a very simple uh, example, uh, mattresses. Uh, you can imagine how complicated and expensive it is to separate the materials in a mattress. Uh, but yeah, we see that there is a lot of stuff in a mattress, uh, even a used mattress. I know how it sounds now, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, that are valuable. And uh, by then in investing and in research in how to sort of take care of old mattresses and, and recycle the materials in it, uh, we will learn a lot and we will also uh, be able to use that material as material in new products. I'm allowing one or two questions more since we're starting a little bit late. Uh, this question goes out to uh, Jan. Um, yeah, from me. Yeah, um, uh, we're having an event. There's an event on Monday. It's about IoT, machine learning, and uh, big data and sustainability. How you use the technology to uh, sort of basically become more sustainable? Because we do have amazing technology. And um, I personally work uh, with. Uh, we're building a 5G network slash social media network uh, for India to connect all the uh, recycling. Uh, the, the entire recycling industry. So uh, with the knowledge that Telenor has, building technologies, building infrastructures, instead of looking at 200 million that you're talking about, which is going to transform, uh, I mean, this is just an idea. I mean, uh, looking for your... Uh, w w instead, why don't you uh, enable the recycling industry to be much more... Uh, sort of be much more sort of, how can I say, more streamlined and and and, and, and generate a revenue through that. I mean, um, is, is there anything, is there any thought that's put into something like that using IoT 5G for? Absolutely. It's a good, very valid point and a good idea. So I'd be happy to discuss that with you further uh, to understand what the real is, uh, how, how your proposal is uh, in practical way. Um, but um, in some of the countries we are in Asia, of course, the, um, the recycling industry is not, um, uh, even if they have a recycling industry, it's a lot of issues around it, like child labor, etc. So we have very strong rules that we, we ourselves follow, and we also uh, support the developing the industry, uh, at least indirectly, by being present and with our needs. 
uh, but it's, uh, I think um, uh, we can't sit still, uh, even if it's not our responsibility at some after some point, if you have recycled it or sent it to a proper place for reuse, yeah, we can't uh, stop that. So I think uh, as an industry and as a company, we should take uh, more responsibility in, in um, supporting that way uh, of uh, thinking. So I'll be happy to follow up with you. Mm. Okay, so I've gotten the signal quite obviously from uh, business. <laughs> business uh, for Peace Foundation that we have to end uh, this session tonight. Thank you all for coming and just as a wrap up, uh, the three of us at least, I think I am at least, and you two hopefully is going to stay around a little bit, so come up to us for further conversations. Uh, but it's been a good talk and for me it signals that a lot of things is happening but we don't know all about it and i think all of us should be better telling kind of what's happening using our also purchases power to ask the right questions why isn't it so why why aren't you doing like that and come up also with new ideas and i also want to kind of challenge the thinking we currently have which was reminded um by you katrina in the terms of what we take for granted today is a necessity, is not so necessarily in 30 years' time. So when we say that the different raw material that we are dependent on today from some certain technology, that's not necessarily the case in 30 years if you look at technology development and 3D printing. So also what we have to change is our current investment thinking and current that we always invest in the current things right now to think that is the solution in 30 years time, which is not necessarily the case. That was a yachtesik <laughs> for me. Thank you all for coming and please enjoy the evening. Thank you.